Good evening. We're glad you've joined us for this midweek moment. Uh, we're going to begin to sing with uh, the song All to Us and then sing the verse of, uh, what's the other one? Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Father, we do thank you for the privilege that we have to get to, to meet with you, that you make yourself available to us, that you give us access to come and to, to bring our request to you, and sometimes just to rest, uh, 
just to rest in your presence, rest knowing that you're our Father, that because of what Christ has done, we have the privilege of coming to you as your son or as your daughter, just enjoying being with you and being reminded that because of who you are, because you're in control, there's not a thing in front of us that we're to fear. Because you're with us. Father, refresh our spirits tonight. Encourage us as we continue to follow after you. And Father, let us hear your voice so that we recognize where you're leading us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good evening, church family. Thank you for joining us for this midweek moment. We're grateful for this time, as always, just to be able to, to set aside some time to reconnect and to encourage one another. I just want to remind you of a few things coming up in the next few weeks that you'll want to take note of. Uh, first of all, uh, a week from Sunday, Carter Blood Care is going to be here for another blood drive on our campus. They're going to bring their bus, as they have a couple of times the last uh, few months. And uh, what you need to do to participate, you can sign up for a time slot on November the 8th between 12 o'clock and 3 o'clock. And to sign up, you'll need to call or email our church office. And when you get a time slot, then on the day of, you'll want to come here in your car a little bit before your uh, reservation time, bring your mask, and then they'll call you when they're ready for you to go in. And uh, again, this is a great way for us to serve our community. And uh, just in the past uh, couple of times they've been out, we have had all the time slots filled up. And so if you haven't yet made your reservation, uh, you'll want to do that. Also, remember that uh, our annual music ministry auction is coming up. It's going to be the week of November the 8th through the 15th. Uh, we are now taking items uh, that we're going to put up for auction. And so if you have some items that you'd like to donate, you can bring those by the church office. Or if you're going to prepare some baked goods, if you would send us a picture of that, we'll put that up. And then on the 15th, uh, you can bring uh, the fresh item and we'll deliver those to the winning bids. The way that we'll bid, uh, the pictures of everything will be loaded on Facebook. And you'll bid in the comment section below those photos. And then on November the 15th at 12 o'clock noon, that's the, the deadline. The highest bid will be declared the winner, and we'll make arrangements with you to pick up your items. Last, an, uh, Lottie's Place is coming up. This is our annual uh, way of, of reaching out and caring for families in our community, um, particularly those connected with Lynn Hill Elementary School. And every year we highlight some families in need uh, and uh, come alongside them, provide some some, just some support, some supplemental uh, help, some Christmas gifts and things like that to the kids. And uh, this year we've adjusted our plan a little bit. Rather than doing kind of the big Christmas store like we've done in the past, this year it's going to be done through our, our missions ministry team and some small groups that they put together. And so what we're asking for your help with is if we could have, uh, rather than bring items and things like we've done in the past, this year... Uh, we would just ask everybody to donate money that will go to gift cards and, and gifts. And so uh, just to let you know, we will need that in by November the 15th. So if you can make your donations then, that will let us know how many families we're able to support and at what level we're able to do so. So November the 15th for your uh, donation in for Lottie's Place. Well, one of the things that we've come back to frequently over the last few months is this idea of the church uh, being a fellowship of difference, different folks from different backgrounds with different perspectives. Um, that's a, a, a picture that uh, my professor, Scott McKnight, uh, kind of put forward as uh, this is a good picture of the church. And it is. It's a beautiful picture of the church. And uh, we've seen that and experienced that here in our own church family. One of the things that makes us a rich, life-giving church family is the differences among us. You know, we, we uh, have different backgrounds. We do approach things with different perspectives. And uh, a lot of times those differences, it, it makes kind of like, like music. It's, 
It's not just the melody that makes the music. It's the melody and the harmony working together. And that's what makes it a full, rich, beautiful thing. Same way with the church, our differences are often what God uses to make this a beautiful community, a beautiful church family, um, where our differences, we call out the best in one another. But one thing that's also true when you, you know, actually live that out, when you're a fellowship of difference, when you're a community made up of men and women and boys and girls and people from all different backgrounds and different perspectives, it also takes work. Sometimes it's a challenge to learn to be a family with all these different perspectives and all of our different ideas on things. And sometimes, in order to be that family, we have to deal and work out our differences. Sometimes it, it leads to conflict, and we have to work that out in a Christ-honoring way. And sometimes we think that's just some, something that's new, something that we deal with now. But when we go back, and if you actually peel back uh, some of the layers and read in Scripture... You see that God's people have always dealt with it. That's just part of being a church family. That's just part of being a fellowship of difference. And that's actually how God brings about his work in us. And so tonight I want us to see uh, how that played out in one of the churches that Paul ministered to. And so if you have your Bibles close by, go ahead and turn to Romans uh, chapter 14. And Paul's writing this letter to the churches that were in Rome, and they were a diverse church body. They had people from different backgrounds. Uh, specifically, there were a number of people there in the church that uh, were, had been Jewish, were, were raised uh, as Jewish, had followed the Jewish law, and they continued to do so even after they put their trust in Christ. That was the way that they had expressed their faith. And Jesus is their Lord, but they continued to follow some of the, the practices and the requirements of the Jewish law, specifically eating kosher food and observing the Sabbath and a few things like that. But there were a number of other folks that had accepted Christ there in Rome that were either Gentiles or some that had been Jews that then chose not to follow the Jewish law in those restrictions. They didn't follow the, the dietary laws. They didn't eat just kosher food, and they didn't worship only on the Sabbath. They, they followed different ways. And they're learning to be a church family together. And so Paul writes to address to them how they're to do that and how they're to work through some of the differences that came about because of their different perspectives. And this is what we, what's going on here where we read in Romans 14, starting in verse 1. Paul tells them to accept the one whose faith is weak without quarreling over disputable matters. One, who's, one person's faith allows them to eat anything, but another, whose faith is weak, eats only vegetables. The one who eats everything must not treat with contempt the one who does not. And the one who does not eat everything must not judge the one who does, for God has accepted them. So Paul's kind of dealing with this. He's stepping into this conflict, these two different sides, and you notice he has a name for them, the weak and the strong. The weak were those folks that continued to follow the Jewish dietary laws and the Sabbath practices. And then the strong are those that don't follow that, the folks that say, yeah, I'm Gentile, I've never followed this, or maybe they were Jewish, but uh, we say, you know, I'm following Christ, I don't have to do that any longer, so I'm not going to. Now, this idea of weak and the strong it's not just um, derogatory language for you know, the folks that are following the Jewish law or, are weak in their faith. There is that aspect of it clearly here. But in addition to that, it has another nuance because from all things that we can tell here, the folks that were the strong, the folks that didn't follow the Jewish dietary laws, were also in the majority. And so they were the strong by position. They could say, we're the majority, we're going to rule, we're going to do this our way. And so Paul is dealing with these two different sides, and he's helping them see, how do you navigate this? How does it work when you're, you know, have these different, different points of view? He mentions the food here. As he goes on throughout the passage, he's also going to talk about the Sabbath law. Some of you follow the Sabbath, and that's your holy day. 
Others of you worship on different days and it doesn't matter to you. And Paul says it's okay to have differences in what he calls here disputable matters. He recognizes there's a place and a way for you to arrive at different convictions in these areas. He says that's perfectly okay. And he recognized that disagreements are a part of being in a church family. There's things that we're going to come at. We're going to arrive in a different conviction. And it's not, it's not sin. There's things where we kind of look at the scripture and read, what's the best way? What's the best way for me to follow Jesus in this particular way? What's the best practices for me? And we're going to arrive in different positions on that, different, different convictions. And Paul says, you know what? That's going to happen, and that's okay. Don't let that bother you. Don't be surprised when even in the same church family, you're going to look at things, and sometimes you're going to arrive at a different conclusion than your brother and sister. And that doesn't mean that they're wrong, and it doesn't mean that you're wrong. But how do we do that? How, what do we do when that happens? Well, Paul says here in verse 12, he says, Remember, so then each of us will give an account of ourselves to God. In other words, we're all going to answer to God for our conclusions. And so don't be so caught up on, on trying to fix your brother. Remember, they're going to answer to God on their convictions. And if they're able to stand before God with an honest heart, say, yeah, this is really what I think is best, that's fine. That's okay. Paul says there's room in this church family for differences on these disputable matters. But here's what he wants them to do. Verse 13, he says, Therefore, let us stop passing judgment on one another. Instead, make up your mind not to put any stumbling block or obstacle in the way of a brother or sister. Verse 14, he says, I'm convinced, being fully persuaded in the Lord Jesus, that nothing is unclean in itself. But if anyone regards something as unclean, then for that person, it is unclean. If your brother or sister is distressed because of what you eat, you are no longer acting in love. Do not, by your eating, destroy someone for whom Christ died. So Paul is stepping in and he's saying, look, the folks that follow the law, they're judging these folks in the church that don't follow the law, that eat pork and whatever else. And they're saying, look, look at those folks. They're, they're, they're just living like pagans do. And he says the folks that don't follow the law, they're looking down and saying, look at these folks that follow the law. They're just legalists. So these guys are judging the non-law followers. These guys are judging the law followers. And Paul's saying, look, all of you are going to answer to God for your convictions. And if you're convinced if the Bible gives you know, an openness for you to choose, if there's a, not a clear answer from Scripture, then consider it a gray area. Recognize that you'll disagree. But don't destroy your brother or sister because you draw a different conclusion on one of these lesser disputable matters. Paul says, look, it, it really, it's not, it, it's not something where there is a right or wrong, but what's wrong is, when you try to press your convictions on someone else in a way that harms them, or you try to press your freedoms in a way that, that shows an unloving, unkind, inconsiderate spirit to your brother or sister. Paul says, no, that's not how it's supposed to work. You can disagree. You can hold different convictions. But you need to learn to do so in a way that respects and shows love to your brother or sister with the opposing view. And so this is how he, he goes on and, and he explains that this is what they're to do as followers of Christ, as people living in this fellowship of difference. They're to work for the good of the other. They're to work to show love toward one another and to recognize that these small things, these differences in conviction, they're not meant to drive them apart but rather as a church family, they're to reach across these differences to respect 
the differences and to work to love one another. You know, we could look at, um, at these disagreements and recognize there are disagreements that are there in our own day, and there always will be. You know, we look around in, in our day, some of the different disagreements, uh, of course, everything right now is political, right? So that could be a co- whole conversation in itself. But even now in this pandemic time, we recognize here in our church family even, folks have come to different convictions about what's the right way to navigate this pandemic. And that's okay. That's one of the things that we've worked hard to do as a church family is to recognize and respect that within our church family there are going to be differences of conviction. And that's good. That's okay. That shouldn't surprise us. Because tomorrow there's going to be a whole new set of differences of conviction. There's going to be a whole new set of issues that we come to different conclusions on. And that will continue to be from this point forward on in until the day the Lord comes back. That's a normal part of being a church family. But what we don't want to do is we don't want to follow the model or the example of our incredibly polarized and toxic culture. You know, right now, you probably have noticed, folks don't discuss, folks scream at one another from opposing sides. And, you know, in a broken world, that sort of thing, that sort of thing will happen. Maybe that sort of thing should even be expected. But as followers of Christ, that's not how we're to be. As God's family, as people called by his name, that's not the way that we're to live. Even when we have differences of conviction, we don't want to get into yelling at each other from the other side. Instead, we want to learn how do we love and respect one another even while holding and recognizing differences of conviction. And so that's what we want to do. We want to instead be people that live out our faith and live as a fellowship of difference. And what Paul calls the people to, he gives the example to right here in verse, uh, chapter 15, verse 1. He says, we who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. He says, those of us who consider ourselves strong in the faith or those of us who are in the majority, we need to be willing to lay aside our rights, lay aside even some of our convictions for the benefit of those who are in our church family. You know, sometimes the most important question we ask isn't what can we do, but it's what should we do for the benefit of our brothers and sisters. And that's what Paul is leading the people here to ask. He's saying, yeah, I know some of you Man, you love to to chow down on some pork ribs, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with that. If you're convinced of that before the Lord, do it. But don't flaunt that in front of your kosher food-eating neighbor. Don't, Don't be a jerk about that. Instead, be considerate. Recognize he has different convictions. And don't Don't put a stumbling block in there that's going to divide you. Instead, understand and respect the differences. You don't have to pretend they don't exist. But respectfully work past them. Sometimes that means lowering your rights, putting aside your rights to consider what's good for the other person. Chapter 15, verse 2, he says, Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up. For even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. For everything that was written in the past to teach us, so that through the the endurance taught in the scriptures and the encouragement they provide, we might have hope. He says this this is just part of being the people of God. And you can see how, yeah, it's hard work. And we've seen from scriptures past. We've seen from just the example of God's people down through the ages. This is a normal part of being a follower of Christ. 
Sometimes you set aside your rights for the good of others just as Jesus did. He summarizes in verse 5, and this is a charge. He says, May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude of mind toward each other that Christ Jesus had, so that with one mind and one voice, you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the picture of a church. Different people, different backgrounds, different perspectives, but with one mind, one voice, honoring, celebrating, following Jesus. That's who we're called to be. That's how we're called to live. And yeah, it it takes work. And it takes us really frequently putting aside our rights. But you know the beauty of that? It's in learning to live, learning to honor one another, and learning to put down our rights, and learning to, you know, to be flexible for the benefit of others. That actually makes us more like Jesus. That shapes us to be the people that we're called to be. And so we can talk about many of the things that that you know, we do to, to, to grow spiritually, but one of the things that we do to grow spiritually, to become more like Jesus, is actually learn to live in a family with these disagreements and learn to navigate that together. God uses that to shape us to be like Jesus. And so, church family, I just want to encourage you. Um, this is not the way that's normal for our world. Um, this is not the way that, you know, we're kind of, Uh, used to seeing around us all the time. But this is the way of Jesus. And this is the way that we're called to follow. And so, uh, as we arrive at different convictions on some of the issues in our world, let me just encourage you. Let's not just ask what can we do. Let's ask what should we do for the benefit of those in our church family. What should we do for those who have different conclusions? How can we show our love and kindness and respect to every person who's a part of our church family? Because that's who we're called to be. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for your faithfulness. That you do guide us in this. That you have given us examples here of our brothers and sisters long before us, who sought to honor you with the way that they live and the way that they, the way that they work out their differences of opinion. Father, that's who we want to be because that's the example that you set for us. And so, Father, show us how to do everything in love. Show us how to be of one mind and one voice honoring you. Show us how to, how to look not to our own interests, but to the interests of others. Show us how to live as a family so that we can be a light to a watching world. God, we need your Spirit's help to do this. It's not natural for any of us. And yet, when we pursue it, you work to make us more like you. So continue that work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.